makes it. Hi, and welcome to the voice of Bold Business Radio. I'm your host, Jess Duell. You are listening to Increase Our Confidence. And there are so many ways and so many topics that we could explore under confidence, yet we're zeroing in on one. We're zeroing in on leading and leadership and specifically the path that both men and women women play in their own advancement and the advancement of others. And it does start with where we're at. And I recently read this book. It came across and I have I have it all dog-eared and there's all kinds of stuff all ready to go. It's called Breaking Through Bias by Andy and Al. They are co-authors of this. And I'm going to introduce you to them in just a minute. The reason that this show exists was because I was enthralled from the very first sentence in the very first page of the end of the book, which I always read before I read the beginning of the book. So I knew I was going to have a a playbook to work with, if you will. We have this desire to participate, to show up fully, and even to be our true authentic selves in a world where that's still new and unusual. And what does that actually mean? So We're going to talk about that and confidence. Where does it come from? What does it mean? How do we practice it? When did we first start getting our confidence? When did we first have our our, our leading opportunities? And when did we have our first ally? All of those are the types of questions that will be answered directly and indirectly in this program. So let me introduce you to Andy and Al, and then you will get to meet them right after this opening. Andrea Kramer is an attorney and partner in the international law firm of McDermott, Will, and Emery. Because mentorship opportunities for young executive and professional women are so limited, she co-founded the Women's Leadership and Mentoring Alliance to recruit senior women to mentor and support younger women on their way up. Alongside her distinguished legal career, Andy is a nationally recognized advocate for women's advancement and an authority on gender communication. Alton Harris, was a founding partner of the national law firm of Nixon Peabody. Over the course of his career, Al has grown increasingly concerned about the barriers and biases of women and what they face in the traditionally male career environments that he was a part of and that his clients also faced in their environments. His focus is always on the communication skills that women need to advance in their chosen field despite the prevalence of negative gender stereotypes. I cannot wait for you to meet Andy and Al right after this. Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business, the show that provides everything smart leaders need to evaluate situations, build relationships, and create solutions. Jessica Duo candidly talks about the skills necessary to build tenacity and do more with less. And now, here's Jessica. Andy, Al, thank you for being here today. How is it in the Chicago area? Well, it was snowing just a few minutes ago. It seems to have stopped now. Although we understand you could use some snow in Colorado. Yeah, we could use a lot more snow in Colorado. We've had a little bit now that we're into spring. uh, And maybe in a few weeks on my birthday, we will have more. So keep sending it this way. Keep sending it this way. (laughs) We'll take it. We'll take it. We do need it. Ah. Man, confidence. I tell you what, I know I reached out to you guys out of the blue. It's one of those things that I do. Uh, If there's something that catches my attention and I really feel compelled, I will just reach out and say, hey, and see what kind of a conversation we can have, which is where our very short-lived relationship so far began. And I know some people are like, how can she do that? How can she talk to strangers? What are you talking about? But, you know, Andy and Al, there are other places that I feel very insecure and I don't really have a lot of confidence. And so, you know, attitude is a big deal and how we show up and what we do. And I'd like to start there. What's so important about attitude in today's workplace? Well, maybe I could start with that. Attitude is the way that we approach the world, other people the situations that we encounter. And it either tells us that we can go forward, that we will try, that we will make the effort, or it tells us we're not able, we're not good enough, we're not going to try. So attitude is about 
how we approach the challenges, the opportunities, the situations that we're in. So attitude is all important. It is what determines whether we play the game or sit on the bench. Attitude tells us that we are um, capable or that we are just not up to the job. So attitude, as you said, is everything. And streaked right through that is this concept of confidence. And whether we have the positive self-talk or the less than positive self-talk, that negative stuff going on that allows us to put our foot in the game and take that first step and be on the field or not comes from having confidence. And do we have to take a step back or is it that, you know, to look at that and say, so how does confidence play a role in, in attitude? Having the possibility of attitude shaping how we're going to approach the world is really a lot to do with the confidence point. Because uh, as you pointed out, Jess, you're very confident in reaching out to strangers, for example. Uh, but there may be other situations where you don't feel as confident. And one of the things about success and uh, advancing in our careers is to view success as um, an objective uh, a goal uh, and not to be afraid of taking a step and being rejected. So that you're deciding to reach out to us, for example, showed that you were prepared to be ignored or to be told, no, I'm not interested. Uh, or more likely, as, as we did, we said, we'd love to talk with you. Um, and so what we do is we need to think about confidence as um, uh, looking inside of ourselves and giving ourselves permission to be less than perfect, giving ourselves permission to uh, hit the ground and then dust ourselves off, pick ourselves up and go forward again. Isn't there's a, if I could jump in there, there's a, there's an element to confidence that the, uh, you know, the, the, the old cliche, but still a good one, fake it till you make it, is applicable to. That is, we can often feel very unconfident. We can feel unsure of ourselves. But very often, if we are able to find within us that little bit more of tenacity, of risk-taking, and we can put ourselves forward, even though we are feeling very unsure, lacking confidence, then the next time we do that, it becomes easier and easier and easier until we eventually um, gain that confidence. Andy tells the story that when she first started speaking in public, she would feel sick to her stomach every time she would get up on stage. Well, now she speaks like a pro. She could teach speaking. That's faking it till you make it. That's going forward even when you're unsure of yourself and learning that it isn't so bad to fall down. It isn't so bad to be rejected that we learn each time that happens. I think it's interesting that fake it till you make it got this bad rap in the world of authentically us. Because I, you know, when you say it like that, Al, what I just took away is that until we do something we're unsure of, until we do something where we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and we have an idea of what the options and the results might be, that's actually, it's it's almost a faith, if you will. And fake it till you make it is, hey, I have no idea what's going to happen. Let's go see. And so it's almost an experiment. Exactly. We need to totally, we need to bring this fake it till you make it back. I don't think we can fake it till we make it forever. I mean, I guess I could fake it till I make it to play basketball, but we all know, right? I mean, hello, we all know I am not going to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> so at some, so let's, let's put the caveat on there of, at some point, 
there is something where we have to go, wow, this is just not something we've, we've reached our max. Have you guys ever, and I would say like outside of something like me deciding to play basketball or maybe even become an Olympian or something like that, it, I even probably, there's a chance I could do that. There's a chance I could do that. But am I willing to put in the time and the effort and to, to make the opportunity for those risk, the risks to be taken? I'm not so sure about that. So what's the caveat on that? When do we realize we got to take a step back? You made an important point about, um, you know, how much time and effort are you going to put in? I assume that uh, many of the listeners are uh, familiar with uh, Michael Jordan being um, thrown off of his high school uh, basketball team. Uh, and uh, he just didn't get cut from it or some such thing. And uh, he just went into his room, supposedly closed the door for a while, and then came out and started practicing nine, 10 hours a day. Uh, and so uh, you don't know, um, you really don't know what's going to uh, happen and what, what, what the world is going to give to you. Uh, but I think your point is an important one. You, you use the word authentic. And one of the issues that comes up, especially with women, is that there are all sorts of stereotypes and, and about how women and men and leaders and uh, business people and uh, fighter pilots and family members are supposed to behave. And so with the authenticity stereotype that is um, uh, women are, are basically urged to buy into, uh, there's a belief that somehow you only have one you, that there's only one personality, and that you need to be true to this one you. And the reality is that our uh, confidence, our attitudes, our personalities, our um, behaviors are really like a huge closet where we can go in the morning and if we're going to be uh, on a um, uh, on your radio show and we have a camera, uh, then we're going to dress in a way that's going to be different from if we're going to the beach or if you're going to be going to a black tie dinner. And so we all have, men and women, have multiple characteristics. And one of the things about, um, I think, uh, exuding and showing the elements of confidence is to be prepared and know what it is that you're, um, what you're shooting for. What, what is your objective? Ah, I like the word objective. And the reason it fits to where we want to go next is that we're talking about preparation, two of my favorite words, right? Purposeful action. To have purposeful action, we must be prepared. We must do research. We must plan ahead because the more prepared we are, even if we have a plan, like in the show, right? I put together these starting points of conversation so we can always come back to it and we have a general outline and what our overall intention is. Now that we've started the show, I'm taking notes. We are having this conversation based off of the stories that you tell. The flow of the conversation it may have something different. And I am willing to leave out anything that's on that list for the purpose of the conversation. And all my preparation is not to waste. My preparation is now I can meet you wherever this conversation goes. And I know the research that you do before you go on stage, Andy, and you speak, even back when you had butterflies, now that you are, you know, you are, the, I, I want to see you like talk somewhere uh, <laughs> on stage and see that presence and know that it's inside and out and the path that you have been on we have that objective. And if our objective is to really be authentic, that's very different than walking into a room to network with people that might introduce you to your next large client, that might introduce you to the next person that you want to add to your team, for example. It, it, absolutely. In fact, Al, you might want to talk a little bit about uh, interacting with other people and the um, impression management because our attitudes matter, but then we have to do exactly what you suggested, Jess, which is to apply um, uh, our objective to where we're trying to get. Well, maybe I could amplify that <clears throat> just a little bit. <clears throat> you asked, when are we confident and when it is, is, is it appropriate for us not to be confident, that you recognize that you're never going to be a professional basketball player. Well, that's one kind of skill, but presenting yourself 
selling yourself to other people is a very different kind of skill. And in doing that, in making other people believe in us and our sincerity, our capability, our talent, that's where confidence really shows. And that requires two elements. One of them is an ability to read the people that you're dealing with. That is having a keen enough awareness of how other people are reacting to you. We call that self-monitoring. Having a sense of the impressions that you're making on other people. But the other aspect is when you find that the impressions that you're making, that what other people are taking away from your presentation to them is something other than what you want, that they're reading you in ways that are not positive, are not uh, recognizable as uh, seeing you as a leader, then you need another talent. And that we call impression management. It's an ability to change the way in which you are presenting yourself. And that goes to Andy's point about authenticity. We need to have the capacity to present ourselves as either forceful, strong, decisive, or perhaps what's wrong in the situation is that other people are feeling uncomfortable with our forceful, strong uh, presentation. And what we need to do is open up, be more welcoming, be more inviting, be uh, more sensitive to what others are thinking and wanting to say. So there's a change of character that is essential to that ability to come across just as what you called a leader showing that confidence, but your ability to present yourself in ways that other people read as a competent leader. That's the impression management part. And that's what this you know, increasing demand of authenticity, one true self often gets in the way of. I have a, an actual practical example that just popped into my brain. Uh, Andy, do you have a story that, or Al, even, either one of you guys, do you have a story that you can tell that can articulate, uh, Al, what you were just describing? Because I know, and if you want a second, I could tell my story first. I think you this is- tell a yours really first, good. and then okay. we, could, we could be add on to it. My first company, uh, I started in college with my now husband and a friend. And one of the roles that I played was the face of the company and client relations and, and sales and operations and all that wonderful good stuff that goes with that. And it was an e-commerce company. And so here I am, I'm 19 years old. I go to my first industry event uh, and it was a small industry event by the standards of the time. So it was probably 700 people. And I was listening the first day. All I did was listen. And then the second day I, people were having this conversation and I was a part of it. And all of a sudden I opened my mouth to contribute. And I said something that was correct, relevant, and even an opportunity to build the idea out and take it to the next level to solve this person's problem, whose concept we were discussing. Everybody in the room looked at each other and couldn't figure out where the voice came from. And then I said, yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Jess. And let me repeat what I said. And they all looked at me and they could not believe that I understood what they were talking about, that I had any value beyond being a person for the booth, if you will. And they were really surprised to find out the role that I had within this technology organization. And it was that moment that I first realized, oh, now I have some, I have a great big gap here. And even then I knew, 
uh oh, how I talk and how I show up are very different right now. And I need to close that gap so that my clients and potential clients have as much confidence in me as I know I have in my knowledge of what I'm doing. Well, you point, you've pointed on a couple of important, uh, a couple, there's a couple of important um, uh, threads in your story. Um, one is that there's the gender expectation that um, uh, men, uh, even if they're well-intentioned, have since the, the times that we're three or four years old, we've got stereotypes about how women and men behave and what they're supposed to be like. And so when women are viewed as, uh, is viewed as kind and nice and sweet, then we're in stereotype, we're communal. Uh, we care about community, but uh, men are expected to be and punished if they're not uh, strong and independent. And, and the word is agentic, that the social scientists use, which is somebody who has agency, who's going to get the job done. Uh, and so when women are out of that stereotype of being kind and sweet, and uh, that there's a, a disconnect and people don't expect that. But you also pointed, on, uh, pointed to another issue, which is important, which is you were 19 years old and everybody around you probably was older. And there's a bias and stereotypes about age as well. So being a young person who understands what's going on is also another issue that comes up. So um, there are, we have stereotypes and biases about all sorts of aspects about people, whether it's what school did you go to, or whether you're a good skier, or whether you're, um, whether you're uh, go to this particular church, or whether you believe these things, or whatever. Uh, and so those are things that people carry around habits, basically, often bad habits that uh, don't really apply in evaluating other people. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that when somebody is putting their stereotype and then the bias um, up as a reaction to us, the way that these um, other people at this trade association did, uh, you had different ways that you could have acted. You could have been offended. And that would have been a mistake because you wouldn't have been able to accomplish your objective. And so one of the key things that Al and I always talk about is you cannot forget what your objective is. And sometimes you have to uh, do a little bobbing and weaving in order to get your objective. And by identifying yourself and letting them know that you were the one who um, had made the point, uh, they had to look at you, they had to realize that and acknowledge it. Sometimes they still don't get it. And in that case, perhaps maybe you might have been standing up and um, uh, been make yourself taller or stronger. And so, um, for example, I go by Andy. My name's Andrea. And I um, would get called into meetings and I'd walk in and once the client had his back to the door in the conference room and he I hear him saying, well, wait a minute, Andy's a girl. I cannot work with a woman. Are you, you know, I can't, what are you talking about? And what I did was I uh, put my hand on his shoulder and I made a joke about how obviously um, uh, I was going to be stepping back out and I'll be in in a minute and we were going to start all over because uh, it really wasn't going to be a good way to, to start our, our um, uh, conversation. So I walked out for a minute. I came back in, acted like I'd never seen the guy before. We, and we hit it off. And in fact, we were worked together on projects for 15, 20 years. And so I think that we can use elements of our verbal and nonverbal behavior, sometimes our written or digital communications, in order to communicate what it is that we want to accomplish. And I would suggest that always remembering what our objective is, is ultimately the best way of accomplishing what we want. That ties back to something that is a big theme throughout your book. And in the stories within breaking through bias that you share is 
almost every single one of them, as serious as, as it is, is handled with some sort of um, gentle grit, I'm going to call it, gentleness and humor, because if we respond, especially as women, in, at, at which point in time a woman chooses to respond harshly or abruptly or brashly, there's like no going back. That was, we don't get a go back to start and try again when we show up that way, do we? No, we certainly don't. And uh, it applies to uh, the way that men interact as well. Uh, but um, I'll give you an example. The first time that I was invited to a television program, uh, I was told that I was going to talk about a topic. Um, I was going to talk about uh, leverage buyouts, which was very popular then. And um, I'm going to have five minutes with the producer. So I walk uh, into this uh, studio and it's a zoo. I mean, it's uh, crazy. The people are screaming and things are going on. And then the interviewer finishes with one person and they walk me over to this chair and they put me down in this chair. And I shake hands with the guy and he says to me, we're not going to talk about leverage buyouts. We're talking about mutual funds. To which I said to him, no, I was invited to talk about leverage buyouts. And he said, no, I don't, I don't care about leverage buyouts. We're going to talk about mutual funds. And I hear in the background four. And I said, minutes. And he said, seconds. And now I know that what I've got is I've got three seconds. And the first thing that I think of is I go back to a, a stress dream that I had as a child, that I would go to third grade and I would take my winter coat off and my brownie uniform would not be on underneath it. And that I would be naked. And the first thing that I thought was, oh my God, did I put my suit on this morning? And I look down and I see that I'm perfectly clothed. And I look up with this big smile on my face because it was so funny. And I was so relieved that I was clothed that every time I get to a situation where I'm uncomfortable now, the first thing that I do is I tell myself, well, at least I have my clothes on. <laughs> and so I found that I can apply a little grit and humor um, by just remembering an uncomfortable situation and knowing that the world doesn't end. Brownies, we get to talk about leadership now inadvertently because Girl Scouts is one way that women have the opportunity to show up to learn, not only learn important skills, also start to take a leadership role in decision-making from a very young age. Well, that's absolutely true. And um, uh, one of the important things that Girl Scouts, for example, um, provides young girls and then young women and, and things that we could carry through as we um, uh, into our adulthood is the fact that by the time we're three or four years old, if a boy says, let's go play ball, he's a, he's a leader. And if a girl says, let's go outside and play ball, she's bossy. And if you're really bossy, Jess, I'm not going to invite you to my birthday party. And so Girl Scouts allows us an opportunity to uh, step forward, to raise our hand. And ultimately, whether we're boys or girls, whether we're young men or young women, or whether we're uh, full-grown adults, um, the reality is that uh, we need to uh, both be confident enough to raise our hand, but also confident enough to test run things that may be a little risky, that we may not be confident in doing. Yes. You know, one of the things in that story that really strikes me is also to be a Girl Scout leader, whether it's a mom or a dad or somebody who was a scout in their past, doesn't even matter, right? You were a scout in your past. I'm a leader with no daughter. And what we do with Girl Scouts is create that space for that practice, for that risk taking to be able to be experimented with in a safe place. And for those of us there are many opportunities besides Girl Scouts. We just happen to be talking about one and have time for one. Uh, I think though, too, if we were to look back, we could each find a time when we had the opportunity, whether we chose it or it was chosen for us due to circumstance, to step up, to show up, which 
either reinforced the stereotypes or went against the stereotypes or left us kind of figuring out, well, it's not what I wanted and I don't have anybody to ask. So when we find ourselves without an ally, can you describe some traits so that now that, you know, whether we have kids and we need somebody to help them as adults in our careers, the things that we are trying to do and accomplish, the objectives we have today, tomorrow, the next three years, we need allies for that. And what are some of the traits and characteristics of allies? Because I know we all have some around us. We just might not know who they actually are. I think you're touching on a very important subject because very often we, it's not as though we lack the self-confidence, but we may lack the information. We may lack the perspective within which we can properly evaluate what is going on around us. And so very often we need to have a sounding board, someone that can check our own impressions and say, hey, Jess, I think that this is going on. Am I off base? Am I getting to the right issue here? Am I reading this situation correctly? And so allies provide us with that alternative perspective, that way of testing our outlook on the world. But allies can go a step farther than that. Allies can become mentors. And beyond mentors, they can become sponsors. Mentors are people with whom we can share our most intimate concerns, thoughts, feelings, and we can try to make sense of wh who we are and how we are uh, making our way in the world. But sponsors go a step farther. Sponsors are people that put us forward, that are there to speak on our behalf, that give us the opportunities that we might otherwise lack. So let's think about that from a woman's point of view. One of the key things that's often missing in women's lives are male allies, male mentors, male sponsors. And why are male sponsors so important? Why can't we just have female role models? Well, we haven't quite said this explicitly, but one of the reasons that male allies are so important for women is where do you think the power is in our society at the moment? Where do you think the power is in our businesses, in our profession? Uh, sure, there are women that are powerful, that are strong, but there aren't anywhere near as many women that have that kind of power in corporate America or in the legal profession, or even in the medical profession, as there are men. Uh, and the media profession, your own profession, it remains, despite so many women's images being on media. Who controls the media companies? Who's running the corporate operations? And so male allies, male mentors, male sponsors, are a key aspect of women's ability to move forward and move forward with the kind of grace but decisiveness that they need in order to succeed. I'm nodding my head a lot. We're gonna come back to that because I know that's actually part of managing expectations too. We are going to take a quick break just to say this is program 133 increase your confidence. Our special guests today are Andy Kramer and Al Harris. And we are talking about all things confidence. What makes up confidence? How can women keep the door open when stereotypes harshly put themselves in our face? And just as Al was talking about the difference between ha finding an ally also finding a mentor and finding a sponsor and recognizing through our objectives, which is a theme from this whole conversation, 
and keeping them front and center at all times. Now, we have a very interesting comment slash question-ish from the audience. And I'm going to share this and we're going to make the best of it because we could probably talk about it for the rest of the show. I think though we can get to two, one or two points pretty quickly. Trish, Trish is saying slash asking. I had a different experience. When I was not bossy, I was actually left out. So when I embraced my authority, things improved for me. My question is, why must we always put the accent on the should behave, how women should behave, if my nature is assertive and I'm doing well with, with it the way that it is? Okay, well, absolutely go with it. Um, that we're not in any way suggesting that you should dial down your assertiveness um, in order to fit a stereotype that someone might or might not have about you. And what Trisha's pointed out is an important factor, which is that although stereotypes put women and men into boxes, um, they are um, straight jackets, basically. And that if you demonstrate that you're nice and kind and sweet, uh, then people might like you, but they're not going to ask you to do the important projects that Trish knows she was uh, made for. And so the reality is that you don't be behave in a way that fits and, and, and allows somebody else to be satisfied with their stereotype. But the reality is that sometimes when you confront people, you might need to have that bossiness with a little edge of warmth and welcomingness in order to um, overcome the stereotypes and the biases that the other person has. But whatever you're comfortable with, and if it's working for you, uh, we would never, ever suggest that you do anything differently. Um, I think this goes back to the point I was trying to make a while ago about impression management. It has to do with your ability to accurately read the reactions that other people are having to you. If in fact, uh, Trish is finding that strength, decisiveness, um, a very agentic style of leadership is working for her and is not making the people around her uncomfortable or is not resulting in her being socially excluded or penalized in one way, then by all means, she needs to stay with that characteristic style that works for her. On the other hand, it might be that someone else behaving exactly the way that Trish is behaving is finding that it isn't working for her, that she's getting, oh, uh, a, a negative reaction, a sense, oh, she's so bossy, I don't wanna be around her, or I don't want anything to do with that bitch, or something uh, very unpleasant. So, it is a matter of how we present ourselves in the situations in which we find ourselves and recognizing when, in, when they work and when it's not working. So Trish, go for it. I'd add one thing, which is that as Al's been saying, just to put it into one word, which is context. We never can forget the context that we're in. And so we have to be considering and evaluating the whole situation. Uh, and so Trish, the context has allowed her to, to do, to be exactly the way, as aggressive and assertive as she wants to be. And that's terrific. There's just some situations where the context doesn't allow other women and sometimes other men to, to behave in certain ways. This is a good segue into nodding our natural behaviors of showing what's going on. This was, when I read this piece of your book about nodding, I laughed out loud and I had the biggest, longest belly laugh because it was the second time in less than six months that this particular character trait specifically associated with women has come up. And uh, for example, Steve Rohr was on our show a while ago, and this was the first time I ever heard of it, and I thought it was revolutionary. And then when I picked up your book, I'm like, 
I kind of thought he was kidding, but this is a real thing that we have to pay attention to is how people read our body language. So here I am, I'm nodding away. I'm like, yeah, I'm tracking. Yeah, I'm tracking. And even if in my brain, I'm going, I don't quite see that way. I still have a question, but I want, I'll save it until the end and I'm tracking and we're having this conversation. And at the end, all of a sudden I say something or ask a question that implies a little bit of contrarianism or not agreement, there's a great big gap and an awkwardness that shows up in the conversation because I was showing that I'm in agreement. This concept of nodding isn't necessarily I'm tracking and following you. It's I'm agreeing with what you're saying. So then then the words come out and they don't match the nodding, the in the perception right. of the nodding, right? The, the context in which the nodding was received we have a problem. And I know there are more, uh, I know there are more traits than that. Can you give us a hint of people might not realize that the awkwardness has to do with a disconnect between our behaviors, the actual things that we're doing with our body in a space and time and how they're perceived with the words that come out of our mouth at the same time or later. I'd like to touch on that a little bit and I don't have an exact question around it, but that's kind of the place to be in. Does that give you enough to go with? Yes, it does. Um, uh, One of the things that Jess, you've, what you've pointed out is that the way we communicate is not just through the words we use, but our nonverbal communication as well. Uh, And one of the things that because women, by the time we're three, four years old, we're told, don't be bossy. Don't get your dress dirty. Don't, don't get your tights. Don't, don't tear your tights. And boys are told, oh, just boys will be boys. Go out there and, you know, whatever. You're going to get a free pass. Um, what happens is by the time we're young, young women, and especially when we're at work, um, we've picked up a lot of mannerisms, uh, nonverbal mannerisms, nonverbal, nonverbal behaviors that we do to try to tone down some of the agenticness. So, for example, very often women will communicate in ways that are somewhat different from men, primarily because we're trying to soften the blow of whatever it is we might have to say. So women very often, we will nod our heads, not because we agree, but because we're making a connection. We want the other person to know that we're in fact hearing them and we're listening to them. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but I'm shaking my head up and down to let you know that I hear you. Men don't do that. And so you're right, it's going to be a disconnect for the other person. But for example, women will gesture towards their bodies and men gesture away. Um, And men will, uh, if a woman is, is talking to you, she's probably looking you right in the eye and a man might be looking up at the ceiling. So women will think he's not listening to me. When in reality, he's listening, he's just not looking at her. But when a man is angry, you can bet that he's looking you right in the face. And a woman, when we're angry, we're looking at the ceiling because we have these different mannerisms that can be misread by the other person. And so um, nodding is one thing that women need to be careful about because it is misread so often. And uh, as a young lawyer, I remember walking out of a meeting where I had said basically nothing. And my colleague starts to scream at me that I had, you know, conceded issues to the other side, to which I said to him, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't say a word. And he said, yeah, well, you were nodding your head. And I said, yeah, girls nod their head to say we're listening, not because we're agreeing. And that taught me an important point about that. Uh, But very often, I'll give you another example. Women will often say, I'm sorry. Well, men and women, it turns out the studies show that men and women say, I'm sorry, about the same percentage of the time when they think they've done something that requires an apology, which is in the 70 something percent range. And what happens is that uh, women believe that we've done something that requires an apology more often. So we're going to be apologizing more than men do because of that different um, perception about when an apology is needed. But women also use I'm sorry as a connector. 
So that if you tell me, oh, I'm having a terrible day today, and I say to you, I'm sorry, that doesn't mean that your terrible day is because of me. It's because I want you to know that I am um, uh, empathetic or sympathetic to your bad day. But if there's a meeting and the senior person comes in and says, we didn't, we worked so hard on that uh, presentation, but we didn't get the client or the customer, and the only person in the room who says, I'm sorry, is the woman, then all the men are going to think, well, she obviously did something. It's her fault that we didn't get this project. And so women need to be very careful about apologizing in situations where people could misconstrue it as a, an admission or a, a, a transgression, as opposed to just a connection. And so those are kinds of issues that do come up because of the stereotypes about women and men. And when we have an ally, a mentor, a sponsor, and they do one of those things, the, the, when the objective has been set and the relationship is in place, both sides can have that conversation. What, whoever is the sponsor can hear from their sponsoree, hey, did you notice this? I'm just curious because I have some questions about it as we're learning ourselves and building our awareness. And as well as, hey, I've been there. I've seen this happen. Here's how it might play out. Things to consider before you make your next choice. And that's where those relationships with allies and sponsors and mentors can be lasting and, and go beyond that and actual productive business relationships and life relationships. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, but you're raising the context issue again, ah. because uh, when you're dealing with a mentor or a sponsor, maybe in a very different context than when you're in a meeting with uh, relative strangers and you're trying to sell an idea as opposed to letting your hair down and trying to get honest dialogue. So a lot depends here on objective, as Andy pointed out, on context, and on who you're dealing with. Mentors and sponsors <coughs> are very different from customers and clients. What I'm noticing with the, and this is my uh, perception, and I understand that it is incomplete, so I'm going to preface with that. <coughs> what I'm noticing in this quest for authenticity, we end up seeing, and I see this in the generation that's coming up. They've started their work. They are, maybe they're more likely to start their own companies. They have staff underneath them. They're first-time managers. And they're, they just say like, well, that's just not me. It's not authentic. Why does it actually matter to take this stuff in and go, well, when I just kind of leave it up and not work on it, that's when I'm being uh, inauthentic to myself. That's when I am choosing to stay off the field instead of be on the field. I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. I'm looking at Al, he's looking at me. Um, okay, that's totally fine. Every once in a while I have, I say something that ends in complete silence, which means it was totally misunderstood or I need to put a few no. more words around it. I, I, no, I actually, I, I'm gonna give it a try. What the okay. hell? Um, I think that part of the problem is that in that situation by throwing up your hands and saying, well, that's just not me, then what's happened is you have missed an opportunity. And you've missed an opportunity to, uh, to uh, meet your objective. And so just if we try to boil it down to that, um, because we all have multiple characteristics. The communal characteristics that I referred to um, that are, are generally attributed to women and the agentic characteristics that are generally attributed to men, every one of us, ma male or female, has all of the, those characteristics. We carry them all. It's just a, 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 a spectrum, if you will, of the behaviors that we personally are more comfortable with. And so to say, well, that's just not me and that's not authentic is really selling ourselves short because the ability to dip into ourselves and to um, and to pull out a different characteristic as needed is actually more authentic. 
that's actually an ability to accomplish our objective by knowing more about who we are and what it is that we need to do in order to accomplish our objective <clears throat> at that point. Let me go at this uh, uh, building on what Andy said. Um, very often when someone throws up their hands and says, that's just not me, what's at work are what we call self-limiting biases. We all have stereotypes, not just about other people, the people that we're dealing with, but we have stereotypes about ourselves. And this is particularly true for women. They have stereotypes about what is appropriate for a woman? What is ladylike behavior? What is feminine behavior? What is the kind of behavior that my mother would want me to exhibit? And that behavior is often at odds with the behavior that's called for in the modern workplace, the behavior that is called for in order to put yourself forward, to be uh, a bit self-promoting, uh, the behavior that's called for to uh, pat yourself on the back and say, I'm capable of this. And so we find that very often when people say things like, that's just not me, what in fact they're doing is they're allowing the stereotypes that they've internalized about who they should be to limit uh, their ability to function in that context and to get the job done. So I'd be very leery of believing either about myself or about someone else who says, that's just not me. Because I think it's more often than not, not a sense of that's just not truly me, but they're speaking a self-limiting bias that is holding that person back. And this leads right into where I wanted to go next, which is, back to our confidence. We might need a confidence check. What I just heard you say is we might be like, oh, that's just not me. I'm going to embrace what's me. And you both alluded to this of not only is it a missed opportunity, it's a, it's a way that we set our own limit. And when part of being authentic to ourselves is to become limitless, it's almost this weird counterintuitive thing that's happening and taking place. So let's Let's think about a confidence check for a few minutes. And we, I'd love to hear from you. How do we check in with the confidence that we have? How do we find maybe one or two or more of these limiting beliefs that we might have just embraced for whatever reason? And if there's something else that I'm not mentioning here that should go into some sort of a check like this, how can we do uh, take stock, have a check, and then be able to use that to figure out our best next step? Well, I think that's a terrific um, way to, to get close to a wrap up here, which is confidence. One of the things that we should do every time we're going to go into an important meeting, pick up the phone and try to have an important phone call. If we're going to have a, if we have difficulty with someone we're going to deal with, there's two things that Al and I recommend in our book that I'd like to highlight right now. One of them is, uh, to stand up if you can, or throw your shoulders back, um, open up your chest, throw your shoulders back. Uh, if you stand up, put your feet apart. You could put your hands on your hips. You could look like Wonder Woman or Superman if you want to. You could be going through a, uh, you could be going through the finish line at a marathon, whatever. But don't clasp your hands. Throw your shoulders back. And what happens is that when we do this, um, there's a physiological change that happens in our body. Uh, our testosterone goes up. Men and women have it. It's not just the men. 
and cortisol, which is the fear flight hormone, that goes down. And so by just doing this, this pose that's referred to as a power pose for two minutes is actually going to change our physiology. We're going to feel more confident. We're going to project more confidence to other people. That's a, it has nothing to do with our IQ. It has nothing to do with something that we're born with. We can do this over and over again in a day and help us get into the uh, fake it till you make it side of it. The other thing is very interesting new research is about what we call sort of mind priming, which is that if you take a few minutes and you write down something positive about yourself, a time when you felt great or you felt exhilarated or you felt like you accomplished something and you write this down for three, four, five minutes, what happens is you project more confidence and more leadership skills to the other people around you. And they've done studies where they'll take a third of the group and they'll tell them to write their laundry list or a grocery list, and a third to write about a time when they were really disappointed, and a third a time to write about when they really, really went, something really went well for them. And obviously people don't know what the other people are doing or what this is about. When they put a third, one of each of these people in a group, uh, after the short discussion or whatever, the group is going to conclude 90%, 80, 90% of the time, well beyond what would be statistically um, expected, that the person who had done this positive mind priming is the one who was the leader. And what happens when you're viewed as a leader? You get the same group together again in a week or two. Everybody defers to that person who's perceived to be the leader. They give that person more airtime. They allow that person more of an opportunity to express their thoughts. They treat them as if they're more important. And so what I would say is that for your confidence check, before you do your check, do a little power posing, do a little mind priming, and it can go a very long way. I have one last question to sum up our entire conversation. And if each of you would, would share your thought on this, why is it bold to put our attention and increase our confidence actively? Well, all of us <clears throat> would rather stay in our comfort zones than we would to get out where it's risky. That's just something natural. We don't want to be in risky situations. And so what's important about confidence is that willingness to keep moving out of comfort zones, because it's only out in those new, risky, challenging areas that real fulfillment exists. And so we need the confidence to be bold, we need the confidence to take those risks. And I would end by saying that it's bold to um, uh, own our confidence and to also uh, uh, look for um, opportunities and ways to bring it in because the bolder we are, the more opportunities we have to succeed in whatever the objectives are that we're, we're, that we're, um, that we're striving for. You heard it here, Andy and Al talking to us based a conversation based off of their findings and the publications that they have done and captured in their book, Breaking Through Bias. All the program notes will be at voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P133. That is voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P for program 133. You can also search the site for Increase Our Confidence. We want you to rate this program. We want you to share it with your friends. There is something in here for everyone. It is relevant. It is timely. And it can be used right now. Right now. We want to share your comments with other program listeners so that they know what you like, what you want to see. And we can tailor the show and find the guests that will bring you the knowledge that, of what it means to be a leader in business today. You can listen to the Voice of Bold Business Radio where all podcasts are sold. 
What does it mean to be a leader today? You're defining it with every action you take. You're defining it with every single thing that you do to learn and change and grow as an individual and as a model to others, whether you know it or not. Leading and having leadership always begins with what we do to increase our confidence. Subscribe at thevoiceofboldbusiness.com and get more information, program notes, and past episodes. Bold leaders approach each situation and focus on action to achieve a higher level of leadership. Jessica Duell, your business advocate, is the host of the Voice of Bold Business Radio. Thank you for joining us.